This is a new thing. Um, so, whoo, little weird. I've been building to this for about probably about 16, 17 years. I'm Dr. Alex Lloyd and welcome to the new Jesus. Um, last week we were talking about scriptures where God either says never do this or always do this. Never and always. To see kind of, okay, in the New Testament, the New Covenant, where is God's emphasis? Is it more on sin and staying away from sin and not doing sin? Or is it more on grace and love? And there were two things on the love side, love and um, grace, two things on the negative side, which is sin and the flesh. And in scripture, when you see flesh, it's virtually always talking about sin. And from the flesh comes fear, where scripture says 365 times, fear not, fear not. The other name for the stress response in the body, which is the main place illness and disease come from, uh, emotional, uh, mental illnesses as well, because it messes up your uh, brain chemistry, your hormones, your brain state, uh, all that sort of thing, okay? So from uh, sin and the flesh comes fear. And, and then all of the stuff in our life that comes from fear. Okay, On the other side, there's love and grace, but from love and grace, God doesn't share two more things that kind of come from love and grace, which is kind of how it is about flesh and sin. There's like 47 other synonyms or God's saying in the New Testament, okay, if you are a Christian, if you're born again, if you are a follower of Jesus, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all of that, okay? If, you, if that's who you are, then here's what I've got for you, okay? And it's 47 other things that is almost anything you could ever imagine related to a positive from love, what love and grace does, or even if you don't do the negative sin, what comes from that. And it's just about anything you could ever want. You're protected, you're blessed, you'll always have everything you need, love, joy, peace. Um, God will make everything work out for your best, you're righteous, you're holy, you have no guilt, no shame. I mean, it, it's just incredible the difference in the emphasis uh, in the New Testament and I think it's striking and we are never one time told never sin. The scripture that says never sin doesn't exist. Okay? Um, always love absolutely exists and in multiple places and sell multiple different ways using multiple synonyms and, and parables and stories and all kinds of stuff um, related to the always in love. Where are the passages that say, focus on having a, making a lot of money, putting a lot of money away for retirement, focus on getting the best house in the neighborhood. Maybe that would give you a way to talk to people about the Lord. If you've got the biggest house, they would like to talk to you because they think you're smart or valuable or something. I mean, there could be a rationalized reason for stuff like that, okay? Uh, you know, in fact, in, in, the, um, in the Muslim Bible, okay, it says things like that. You're allowed to lie if it is a business negotiation with an infidel or non-believer in order to gain a business advantage, okay? Because they really don't count very much. They're not, they're infidels. They're not saved, okay? 
And that's also the budding heads in the Muslim world between the Muslims who say God absolutely advocate, advocates killing. He commands it. Kill the infidels, all right? Um, okay, and, and, and here's the reason. They're, they mess up the truth. They make it impure. Now, it's a lot of the same reason. Well, I'm not even going to go there. Okay. But in the New Testament, very, very clear. We're supposed to be focused on love, grace, the things that come from that, always. And there are no scriptures saying, yeah, it would be a good idea to make a lot of money, have a big house, have a great car, uh, wonderful retirement and vacations, and how much of our time do we spend focused there? And ladies and gentlemen, that's a never. N Scripture never says focus there. In fact, it, it talks about uh, love of money being the root of evil and, and, and things like that. Martin Luther King said, you can't ever live the life that uh, God wanted you to live, that you want to live, that you would be happiest with, until you overcome a fear of death and a love of money. He said, you can't ever live a good life until you overcome those. Not just to be saved, to be happy while you're here. Those will mess it up every time. Okay? All right. So, but, but, it's still a huge issue to the, at least the believer's and, and Christians that I work and counsel with as to, okay, yeah, I, I love God, I'm committed uh, to the Lord, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, go to church, all of that, but I still have a lot of trouble getting that translated into daily obedient action, okay? And we talked a couple of weeks ago how God judges the intent of our heart, but the intent of our heart doesn't mean we're going to be able to have the action that corresponds with that because we may not have enough power internally to do that. We may not have enough power to overcome our habits and addictions and desire for money and stuff and seek pleasure and avoid pain. We may not be able to do that, okay, until we change that internal feeling and belief. We're, we're believing something not true that's causing that, and the thing that's not true comes from the flesh and sin, okay? But until we overcome that, very often we can be saved and committed to God and a Christian and go to church every week and all that, but still mightily struggle with habits and addictions and for that to be translated into um, faithfulness in, in your actions and behavior. So today, that's where I want to go. And I think I've got a really great thing straight from Scripture that can help you, I believe, a lot starting tomorrow for your intention to be faithful to God to be translated to actually having faithful actions that are pleasing to God and in harmony with Scripture. And, and, and I think it's very simple, three things. All right, but let's, start, let's not start there. Let's start here. Freedom. We've not talked a lot about that recently. Freedom, and freedom spiritually. Freedom... Uh, does Scripture address that? And if so, how? What's the deal with God and freedom and our being able to behave in a way that we really want to and believe we should from our commitment to God but have difficulty doing? I think it starts with freedom. Definition of freedom. There's two. Number one, the power to write, speak, act without hindrance. Okay? Right, speak, act without hindrance. Basically, I can do what I want to do without hindrance. Second definition, the state of not being enslaved physically or otherwise. 
And this is a Webster definition, but that enslaved, Scripture uses that slave metaphor about freedom and sin and righteousness and all that a great deal. Okay, so I, I believe the de Webster definition is pretty much in harmony with Scripture. So I can do what I want without hindrance, and I'm not enslaved physically or otherwise. I would say uh, a lot of people who have negative habits feel enslaved. If they have addictions, they are enslaved for sure. Once you have an addiction, the addiction's in control, not you. Habit, maybe, maybe not, but you're headed in that direction with a habit, a negative habit, and virtually all of us who struggle with these things have those. We have negative habits and addictions that I believe are largely love substitutes. We really, we want the real thing, the love of God and with other people, but we either don't think that'll happen or it's going to take too long, or not happening the way I want. So I intervene, take unhealthy control, in order to force the end result that I want, and the end result that I have fear about not getting. There's that fear again. Okay, so that's kind of the definition. Galatians 5. It's for freedom that Jesus did this whole thing. It's for freedom that he came down and took on the body of a man and went through uh, throwing up and not sleeping and getting colds and flus, probably, uh, skinning his knee, having people tell him things about himself that don't feel good, uh, y your nose is funny or whatever. I, I don't know, but he, he grew up in a similar way to everybody else, Scripture says he was tempted in all things, just like we are. Okay? So, um, so it's for freedom that he came and went through all that so that you could have freedom, which is, and the passage goes on, to no longer have a yoke of slavery. The yoke is like that yoke that they put on oxen or horses or, or whatever to pull a wagon or to, or to you know, uh, till a field or something like that. But scripture uses that yoke thing as a metaphor for the slavery of sin. And what it says is only be a slave to God, nothing else. But being a slave to God is the prodigal son, right? So if I'm a slave to God, you know, I've sinned and I'm, I'm not wanting to maybe uh, be, it, be confronted with God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit because I've just sinned and I feel guilty and ashamed, but maybe kind of slowly I'm walking home, that prodigal son story, because I don't have any better option and I know my father's at least got food. So he's thinking on the way home, okay, I, I, what am I going to say? I, I'm not going to ask to be his son again because I've blown that. I'm just going to ask to be a slave. I'm just going to ask to be one of his servants, okay? And what happens? He, his father's watching for him, sees him from a long way away, tears off running, uh, doesn't even wait for him to get home. He's not mad at him. He's, he loves him. He can't wait for him to get home. Hugs him. Uh, the son tries to start his speech. Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore, so just make me... And he can't even really get it out, it appears from Scripture. And his dad is, no, you're my son. And he gets him cleaned up, puts a robe on him, a ring on his finger, uh, throws a party. My son is home. That's you, okay? That's what Jesus came for you to have. You're the prodigal son in that metaphor, and that's God's feelings, beliefs, actions toward you, okay? He does not want you to be a slave. He wants you delivered from the slavery of sin to be free. And if you're a slave to him, he's going to treat you like a son, not a servant. Why? Because you are. You're his adopted son through Jesus. Okay, so um, 
That's why Jesus came, for you to never have to be a slave again to Satan or to sin or to an addiction, but to God who will, who will treat you as a dearly loved, highly valued, getting a huge inheritance son. All right. Um, Romans 6, you've been set free from sin. Freedom free. Do you really feel that ever? Have you ever? That you have been set free from sin. That's not a process. That's an event. And it's already happened. Okay? Um, Galatians 3, 1, Paul says, Who has bewitched you into believing another gospel? That's the way he said it. Another gospel. They had gone back into the old law and legalism. And we're saying we, you still have to comply with the old law or you're lost, okay? And Paul, he didn't just say that's wrong. He called it, who's bewitched you into how in the world could you go back to that? That's insane. That is crazy. Who, but most of the believers that I have counseled with over the years, they're still enslaved. So they're bewitched too. But if that's bewitched, then it's still happening all over the place today. Okay? How about you? Do you believe and feel and do grace, love, righteousness? I'm the bride of Christ. I'm uh, righteous, holy, innocent, a saint, um, justified, glorified, called, chosen, protected. Do you do, I know you might say you believe it. Do you feel it? Okay. The Corinthian church was about to split. And they wrote to the great apostle Paul to... Give them the answer. One side of the Corinthian church was saying, mainly the Jews, you still have to abide by the old law. You still have to observe holy days. You still have to be circumcised. You can't eat meat sacrificed to idols, etc. Or I assume they were saying you will be lost. The other side, mainly the Gentiles, was saying, no. This is the new covenant, the new law. You don't have to do that stuff anymore. We don't have to observe those days. We don't have to... We, I mean, we can eat meat, uh, whether it's sacrificed to idols or not. It's just meat. Um, we don't have to be circumcised. You crazy? Get that knife away from me, man. You know, sorry. Probably not something to joke about. Anyway... I think both sides thought they were right and thought Paul would come in and side with them. Paul did not side with either one of them. In fact, what, I, what he said, I think a lot of them were probably shocked at, and some of them were just absolutely thrilled and delighted with the answer because I think it's one of the most brilliant things in all of Scripture. Okay, So Paul came in and he said, basically, I'm paraphrasing, do whatever the heck you want. You want to observe the days, observe them. You don't want to observe them, don't observe them. You want to have your kids circumcised, go ahead. If you don't, no problem. Okay? You want to uh, eat meat sacrificed to idols? It's just meat. God made it. It's good for you. So go ahead and eat it. With the exception in that passage of don't cause a weaker brother to stumble who maybe believes it is a sin, and if they saw you do that, would trip them up. But outside of that, it's just meat, and you can eat it. Okay? But, the one thing you have to do, love and accept each other as brothers and sisters. That's the have to. That's the always and the never. 
in one thing. Never do not accept each other in love and kindness and graciousness and forgiveness. Always love and accept each other with kindness and love and gra That's the have to. Okay? So, Paul basically backs up what Jesus had said when he was asked, is there a greatest commandment? And he said, yeah, love God, love others. And if you've done that, there is no law against that. That sums up the entire law. That's what Paul said. You can throw out all the law stuff. You've got to love each other. Okay? All right. So, um, freedom, the law versus love. Okay, where are you? So, three steps to freedom. I call it the three by three. Okay, three steps to freedom. And it really works, straight from scripture. All right, and it's, and it's easy. It's good when things are easy, right? So, here it is. Number one, present your body a living sacrifice. As an event, I would make a ceremony out of it and actually do it, whatever works for you. But then it's also and every morning all over again for today, okay? And that's uh, Romans 12. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, all right? And if you present your body a living sacrifice, it says you will know the truth and have the ability to do it. So, know the truth, and now my, my good love-based intentions are realized into faithful action. Now, I both know what the faithful action is, where I maybe didn't before, and number two, for whatever reason, maybe several reasons that we've talked about, I now have the power to do it. I exchanged my strength for his, got more faith, and that faith is the substance of things not seen. So that becomes the substance of my hormones, brain chemicals, brain state, etc. And I, I feel different. All right? Number two, pray without ceasing. That is 1 Thessalonians 5, and that's the same passage where it says, always rejoice and always give thanks for everything, anything and everything. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. So pray without ceasing. So that means spending lots more and really constant time with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, all right? He's always there. You are never alone. You understand that? Very clear in Scripture. You are never alone. The Holy Spirit lives in you 24-7, 365. You are one with Jesus, the mystery of the ages, and God is everywhere. God is all and in all. That's Genesis. And then David said, where can I go? I go to the heavens, you're there. I go to Hades, you're there. Where can I go? And his, and his conclusion was, there's nowhere. You're everywhere. And he is. So you're never alone. When you close that door or lock it or, or go off by yourself or whatever, you are never alone. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, maybe angels, they're there, clearly, from Scripture. So act that way. Act like God's there. Act like Jesus, the Holy Spirit, are there. Act, act like angels are there. Talk to them. Listen. Share. Ask questions. You'll become closer and closer and closer and closer. And the closer you get, the more, the more love and faith you have from that relationship. And when it's enough faith, that will change the substance of your body, change your thoughts, feelings, beliefs, change your actions. Okay? So, pray without ceasing. Number three, Philippians 4. Think about these things. What is true, love, excellent, worthy of praise? We've talked about how the latest studies say we lean 80% to the negative, uh, just average person, 
and about 50% of what we believe about ourselves and our life simply is not true, okay? Well, instead of thinking about the untrue things, the fear-based things, and the untrue things are virtually always fear-based, okay? So instead of that, instead of uh, thinking about things for my body, whether it's uh, a cup of coffee or relaxing at the end of the day in the recliner or, um, you know, something, whatever that makes you feel better, instead of focusing there, which is where we're focused most of the time, either on our physical body and things related to that, or seek pleasure and avoid pain all through our day, okay? But instead of that, Think about these things. What's true, lovely, excellent, worthy of praise. So think about those kind of things. Pray without ceasing. And then before you did all of that, present your body both as an overall event in your life and this morning for today as a living sacrifice. So I give you everything related to pain and pleasure, related to my physical and external circumstances and body for you to do with it as you will. But I'm laying that down. I'm going to pray without ceasing. I'm going to talk all the time uh, as, a, as a friend, as a father, as a mentor, as a whatever, okay? And then think about the positive love-based things, which would be scripture. David said, I meditate on your words day and night. Or, or just... Things that are beautiful, mu beautiful music. Doesn't have to have words about Bible or scripture. Uh, God made beauty. God made art. God made, okay? So, uh, it, scripture says David was playing a tune on the guitar. Not the guitar, but he was playing a tune. And, and God really liked the tune. It pleased him when, when David played that. We don't have any evidence that he was singing scripture. Maybe he was, okay? But the, the, what I get more from it is God just liked it, okay? God invented music, right? Scripture says God sings over us, okay? All right, so those are the three steps. Present your body a living sacrifice, pray without ceasing, and think about these things. And if you do that, Number one, you will know the truth and be able to do it. Number two, you'll have more and more power, which means more and more faith, which means that not only will it change my brain states and chemistry and stuff like that, okay, but it, it'll be, it, it'll allow me to turn my intention into faithful love-based action. And then number three, if I pray with that, think about, these things, the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Okay? So you'll be able to do, you'll be able to know what's right, you'll be able to do what's right, you'll have the power to do it, and you'll have peace through it all. How's that? For a pretty simple thing, for your actions to be faithful today. Okay, now we've talked about a lot of other peripheral issues you could, you know, add to that, but you can also just think about it in this very simple three-step. Here's what you do. Here's what it does in your life. Okay, and to me the conclusion is Ephesians 3, uh, be a life beyond what you can ask or imagine. That is not possible with what we talked about last week where the average person has 42, on average, sin thought things that could become sin actions that you have to deal with, um, be tempted by, choose to do it or not do it. If you do it, then deal with the guilt and shame and repercussions of having just sinned it's impossible to, let, to be free, I believe, the way God is saying he wants you to be free 
if you're dealing with 42 sin things a day and the guilt and shame that come with those, it's simply not possible, okay? And, and so it seems clear to me that when God talks about he wants us to be free and, and describes what that is, okay, and then he has the emphasis in the New Covenant that we talked about last week, that is, you know, a few things talking about sin, but not saying to never sin, and all kinds of things, 47 or more things about love and grace and to be focused there and what those do in your life, etc. Okay, well, we can't have freedom. I don't believe in the way God intends if we're living that 42 sins a day and the guilt and shame and everything else that come from those. I think it's absolutely impossible. They're mutually exclusive, okay? The only way to get the freedom is to somehow not have to deal with all that sin and guilt and shame as far as me being guilty of it and I go from save the loss, save the loss, save the loss 42 times a day or, or, or whatever. That will never work. And, and, and what we're talking about is the present moment here. Okay, um, the pain pleasure thing really wants us to be focused in the past and the future, and that's what it tends to do in your life. Okay, what I want next or don't want next. Okay, freedom is not past or future, it's the present moment in love. Okay, that's where it comes from. That's the Peace of God will pass understanding if you're thinking about what? What is true, truth? What is lovely, love? Not from sin. From thinking about sin comes more sin and guilt and shame. Okay? So, um, try it. Try it this week. Three by three. Here's, here's three things to do. When you do them, here's the three things that come from that, and what comes from that is freedom. Internal, in your heart, mind, memories, thoughts, feelings, emotions, versus a yoke of slavery. Addictions, habits, I can't do it right, guilt and shame, etc. All right? Start. Praying for, seeking, and experiencing the freedom. That's the whole reason God, Jesus came and did what he did, so you could have that freedom. Don't let Satan trick you out of that or steal it. Okay? Start today, now. Search the scriptures for yourself. Don't let another day go by without the freedom from sin, from uh, have-tos, from condemnation, from negative feelings, emotions, illness and disease in the body. Don't live another day without the freedom that Jesus died for you to have. Thank you so very much. Have a wonderful, blessed day. Thank you.